As we stand, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide our thinking so that we may more faithfully trust and obey the Lord Jesus Christ for his name's sake. Amen. Well, the title of this talk is The Genius of the Church of England. The Church of England is a Catholic Western English Reformed Church. And how important that we understand that. And uh, the Reformation, not referendums, but the Reformation was not homogeneous. Quotes, as there were many reformers, so likewise many reformations. Every country proceeding in a particular way and method, according as their national interest together with their constitution and clime inclined them. Now that was Thomas Brown writing correctly in 1642. But he praised the genius of the Church of England, quotes, whose articles, constitutions and customs seem so consonant unto reason. So the four main 16th and 17th century traditions were the Saxon tradition of Luther, the Genevan tradition of Calvin, the Dutch uh, tradition set at Dort, and yes, the tradition of the Church of England as Elizabeth I left it. Now it, it is the church order and attendant, attendant theology of this tradition that is the foundation of and the benchmark for the Church of England and the Anglican Communion or true Anglicanism. So what is this Anglican or English Reformed tradition in essence? And so what should the Church of England be seeking to re-establish? Well, first it is Catholic. All the mainstream or magisterial reformers, those with whom the state authorities and the magistrates align themselves, wanted to be Catholic, unlike some of the more radical reformers. Being reformed meant there was something already in existence that needed to be reformed. So the Church of England certainly didn't begin with Henry VIII, as some people think. The Greek term Catholic is used rather than the Latin universal because of its use in the phrase the Catholic creeds, the Apostolic, Nicene, the Apostles, the Nicene, and Athanasian creeds. These three creeds were the result of the first four general councils of the church, when much of the time was spent on the vital doctrine of the Trinity and on Christology, the person and work of Jesus. As the international language was still Greek, so two of those creed, three creeds, the Apostles and Nicene creeds, were written in Greek. And so the use of the adjective Catholic as against universal has therefore come to imply doctrinal or creedal universality and not just territorial universality. So the reformers were Catholic as they claimed to be going back to the early fathers of the church and not only the New Testament. But the Bible of the Old and New Testaments was their final authority, not the Pope and the Roman Catholics. Our reformers uh, wanted what is described in the Anglican homily, an exhortation to obedience, quotes, the Catholic faith contained in the scriptures. The reformers did not want to ignore or lose continuity with the wisdom of the church where it was based on the Bible and where it was wise down the centuries. They took seriously, and so should we, Ephesians 3 verses 18 and 19, and Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints down the ages and across the world, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So like the other main Reformed traditions, the English Reformed tradition is Catholic, but Reformed Catholic. Secondly, the Church of England is not a middling church. It's not a halfway house between the Pope and Calvin. If anything, it is a halfway house between Luther and Calvin. But that doesn't mean it is the lowest common denominator version of Reformed teaching and belief. Professor Oliver Donovan criticised this, this popular account of Anglican moderation that says it is a steering a steady middle path 
between the exaggerated positions of Rome on the one hand and Geneva on the other. He says, I quote, there was nothing particularly middle about most of the English reformers' theological positions. Their moderation consisted rather than in a determined policy of separating the essentials of faith and order from adiaphora, things indifferent. Again, moderation, Anglican moderation, is the policy of reserving strong statement and conviction for the few things which really deserve them. Certainly the Anglican settlement of Elizabeth I was by no means a fudge over essential matters. From then on, the Church of England was to be theologically rooted in the 39 Articles, the Book of Common Prayer with its ordinal, and the homilies, printed sermons to be read in churches. With regard to the homilies, the first five in the first book of homilies, written by Cranmer under Edward VI, mainly are basic reading for the theology of the Church of England. They are on scripture, sin, salvation, faith, and good works. And they are still easy to read, and they give you, in short space, the gospel fundamentals of the Church of England. The second book of homilies, published by the authority of Queen Elizabeth, the first is important as showing the concerns current at that later time of the settlement. And read in context, they too are still relevant for today. Thirdly, the English mainstream reform tradition, recognising its policy regarding things indifferent, meant they were different to the more non-conforming English reformers with their regulative principle. Now, the issue had first cropped up in Cramner's time when John Hooper had been against wearing robes. Hooper's views were expressed in his The Regulative Principle and Things Indifferent. He wrote, Nothing should be used in the church which does not either the express, has not either the express word of God to support it, or otherwise is a thing indifferent in itself, which brings no profit when done or used, but no harm when not done or omitted. But then he said this, indifferent things must have their origin and foundation in the word of God. Now this is the regulative principle. For many it meant that as robes and wedding rings together with a host of other things including festivals are not mentioned in the New Testament, they cannot claim to have their origin in the word of God. Therefore it was argued they ought to be ruled out. In some quarters the issue is still alive today. Indeed the tradition regarding the regulative principle is classically found in the non-conforming more Genevan Westminster Confession of 1647. Chapter 21, section 1 says, The acceptable way of worshipping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will. He may not be worshipped according to any way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. However, the Anglican way is that if something is not forbidden in Scripture and it is judged helpful, go with it. Nor is this all academic, for it not only relates to robes, festivals and the church's liturgical year, but also to the place of music, family services and the seeker-friendly agenda. If you adhere strictly to the regulative principle, much of that will be excluded. So will much of church growth thinking, which in its place and where it is not contradictory to scripture, is helpful. Such thinking is allowed for by the Anglican Reformed tradition's understanding of the Bible. So, in contrast to some non-conformists, the reformers of the Anglican tradition believed that robes, festivals, the sign of cross and baptism, and kneeling at the Lord's Supper were secondary. They were more concerned with what they saw as basic or primary theological matters. Fourthly, as all that shows, the Anglican tradition has adopted the 39 Articles, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer and its ordinal, as the standard for Anglican doctrine rather than the Westminster Confession adopted by the Scottish and English Presbyterian Reformed traditions. This was significant and not only as regards the regulative principle. Uh, principal Griffiths Thomas, the first principal of Wycliffe Hall in Oxford, expresses the virtue of the 39 Articles over the more systematic Westminster Confession for subscription purposes in these terms. There is obvious danger in every attempt at systematizing Christian truth. It is far better to be content with articles or points with gaps unfilled. 
This method prevents teaching becoming hardened into a cast iron system which cannot expand. It is the virtue of the Church of England's articles that they do not commit churchmen to an absolute rigid system of doctrine from which there is no relief and of which there is no modification. Earlier at the end of the 18th and early 19th centuries, Charles Simeon was at Holy Trinity, Cambridge, of whom the historian Thomas Macaulay famously said, his authority and influence extended from Cambridge to the most remote corners of England. His real sway in the church was far greater than that of any primate. Simeon too was worried by any tendency to over-systematise the Bible. In his time there was what was wrongly called the Calvinistic controversy regarding divine sovereignty and free will, and over which the two great evangelists, Wesley and Whitfield, differed. However, in that context, this is what Simeon wrote. The author himself is disposed to think that the scripture system is of a more uh, is of a broader and more comprehensive character than some very dogmatical theologians are inclined to allow. And that, as wheels in a complicated machine may move in opposite directions and yet subserve one common end, so may truths apparently opposite be perfectly reconcilable with each other and equally subserve the purposes of God in the accomplishment of man's salvation. The author feels it impossible to avow too distinctly that it is an invariable rule with him to endeavour to, endeavor to give to every portion of the word of God its full and proper force, without considering what scheme it favours or whose system it is likely to advance. Of this he is sure that there is not a decided Calvinist or Arminian in the world who equally approves of the whole of Scripture, who, if he had been in the company of St Paul whilst he was writing his epistles, would not have recommended him to alter one or other of his expressions. But the author would not wish one of them altered. He finds as much satisfaction in one class of passages as in another, and employs the one, he believes, as freely as the other. Where the inspired writers speak in unqualified terms, he thinks himself at liberty to do the same, judging that they needed no instruction from him how to propagate the truth. He is content to sit as a learner at the feet of the holy apostles and has no ambition to teach them how they ought to have spoken. Fifthly, like Simeon, the Church of England has tried to follow scripture in being biblically balanced. So unlike the Westminster Confession, its Article 17 on predestination affirms the predestination of the elect, but like the Bible does not affirm predestination to damnation uh, actively by God. It does not, however, deny it. It remains silent. But the Church of England is more like Calvin with regard to salvation and the juxtaposition of justification and the glory of God. Where Luther laid most stress on the justification of the believer, Calvin, believing justification so essential, saw God's glory coming first, but with God being glorified through such a pardon. The Anglican, however, would add that God's glory then leads to human flourishing. So obviously and sixthly and finally, the Anglican tradition is unashamedly biblical. This needs to be hammered home. Of course the Bible is not above Jesus Christ. Of course the Bible does not take the place of the Holy Spirit, as is an accusation for some who hold the Bible central. But it does mean that the Anglican tradition, when true to itself, is committed to literacy and so education, and so using your mind. And that has produced, when true to itself, a learned clerical profession with a wisdom from God, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Is that any longer the case? Two people from previous centuries of whom that was true were John Wycliffe and Richard Hooker. 
With regard to the Bible, John Wycliffe, the Morning Star, as he's called, of the Reformation, was adamant about its authority. And wanting a single word to prevent the misuse suggested by the word he used by, to prevent the, the uh, misuse of words simply used to stress the Bible, uh, like infallible in, in, and inerrant, he suggested the words incorrigible. Uh, that is to say, it cannot be corrected, because he was worried uh, that, uh, as today, uh, we should be worried, that uh, sometimes people can claim infallibility and inerrancy as primary in their thinking, nevertheless uh, allow for some, uh, it allows for some liberal forms of exegesis and theology. Perhaps that word needs to be resurrected for today. Uh, then Richard Hooker, a remarkable, most remarkable Anglican reformer and theologian of the Elizabethan settlement, was concerned that the Bible, not the Pope, should be seen as the final authority. But he was also worried that some people were already putting Calvin in the place of Scripture and making him their Pope. His books, he says, uh, says Hooker, were almost the very canon to judge both doctrine and discipline by. Hooker had a great respect for Calvin, but Hooker typifies the Anglican Reform view, the view of Griffith, Thomas and Simeon. It was once put brilliantly by Bob Fyle, the Old Testament scholar, and himself a Scottish Presbyterian. The uh, uh, Anglican Reform view is that, he says, of moderate Calvinism. So uh, is forced to say, it is a pity Calvin didn't write the Bible. Of course, the Elizabethan settlement had endorsed Cramnet's articles, which are so clear about the Bible. All Hooker had to do was spell out more clearly the implications of these articles. He therefore warns of two dangers. One, the danger of thinking the Bible does not teach enough for our salvation and so needs supplementing. And two, the danger of thinking the Bible teaches more than it does. For example, a regulative principle. He quote, uh, quotes, uh, two opinions there are concerning the sufficiency of Holy Scripture, each extremely opposite unto the other, and both repugnant unto truth. The schools of Rome teach Scripture to be so unsufficient, as if, except traditions were added, it did not contain all revealed and supernatural truth, which absolutely is necessary for the children of men in this life to know, so that they may in the next be saved. Others, justly condemning this opinion, grow likewise unto a dangerous extremity, as if scripture did not only contain all things in that kind necessary, i.e. necessary to salvation, but all things simply, all without qualification. And in such sort that to do anything according to any other law were not only unnecessary, but even opposite unto salvation, unlawful and sinful. Hooker's worry was that if you make unfair demands on the Bible, the Bible is discredited. In attributing unto Scripture more than it can have, the incredibility of that do cause even those things which indeed it hath most abundantly to be less reverently esteemed. For Hooker, Scripture is above reason and tradition, but there is a place for both, and that is essential in the Anglican tradition. Hooker admitted the place of script for scripture, tradition and reason. He would, however, have profoundly disagreed if he heard some say that these are three equal authorities that you can juggle to suit your own fancy. This has been a liberal fantasy. Hooker, while not denying the place for tradition or reason, would say scripture must, nevertheless, always judge tradition and reason. That is the settled Anglican Reformed tradition. And that is why Cranmer can write as the very first words of his very first homily, a truthful, the title of the first homily is a truthful exhortation to the reading of Holy Scripture as follows. Unto a Christian man, there can be nothing either more necessary or profitable than the knowledge of Holy Scripture.